Hi, I'm Peggy Farron. Welcome to the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Hey, we're going to be talking with Jennifer King. She's a repeat guest on the Understand Photography Show. And we're going to talk about creating winter landscapes. And you know what? There's a little bit more to it than you would think, so stay tuned. Now, if you really are trying to make more creative photographs, you need to be shooting in the manual mode in most cases. And if you're not, we have an online course. It's called the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography. And it's not just an online course, it's an interactive course. So you have an instructor, it's me, Peggy Farron. Uh, you have homework, you have quizzes to make sure that you're kind of progressing. And the, and the quizzes are kind of like reviews and critiques for your photos, things like that. Our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So check it out. We actually have a class starting on um, just in a few days. So understandphotography.com, check it out. And while you're on our website, make sure to, the very first page, it says click here for freebies. Go ahead and click and you can download, I don't know, we've got all kinds of stuff. You know, which camera should I buy? What if you don't even have a camera? I can guide you on that. Uh, how to get tack sharp images every time. That's one of the choices. What you need to learn to become a solid photographer. Uh, and anyway, there are just a bunch of different choices. You can download them all if you like. And in exchange, we ask for your email and put you on our mailing list. We send out a newsletter once a month full of photo tips and what's happening with Understand Photography. So Jennifer King has been here before and she was an awesome guest. We don't bring them back unless they're really good, you know. <laughs> uh, she was on episode 135 on creative compositions. She is an internationally acclaimed landscape and nature photographer. She's an instructor, does workshops, travels a lot. So welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Peggy. Welcome it's back so to great to be back. Yeah. And actually, I'm very happy to be in Florida because I've just finished all of my winter workshops. So I have been in freezing temperatures for quite some time. Where did it's you nice just come from? Norway. Wow. We were in the Lofoten Islands in Norway, photographing northern lights, experiencing some nice winter weather, gale force winds. <laughs> A whole package. It was fantastic. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, you won't be, you won't be seeing me there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to be where it's warm, I'll say that. <laughs> well, you know what? Let me let me just start. Well, no, first just give our audience a little bit about you. You know, sure. tell us about you. Um, well, I'm Jennifer. I am a, a landscape, a nature, wildlife photographer. I have been teaching photography since twenty twelve. Um, very passionate about photography teaching. I have a fine art background, so when I'm talking about photography, a lot of the creative concepts that I have stem from that, from design and, and from fine art. So that's where I get my um, basics, and then I try to build on that. But, you know, not everyone comes from that background, so I think it's important to learn from everybody, technical people, creative people. I encounter all kinds of people. Um, anyway, I love what I do. I'm a very happy photographer. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And you don't mind the winter, obviously. <laughs> I know. I've become very accustomed to winter. In fact, I think a lot of people are starting to know me as a winter photographer, which surprises me. I used to live in Florida. I was a Floridian for 12 years. And you don't live very far north now, do no, you? No, I'm still considered a southerner. <laughs> but I love winter ever since I started photographing. So winter Yellowstone, winter Tetons, winter in Yosemite. I just got back from the Outer Yosemite Conference, which was phenomenal. Um, I got to, you know, um, be a part of a, an elite group of photographers there. John Sexton, Alan Ross, Charlie Kramer, all of Ansel Adams' group of people, including um, a talk with his son Michael Adams and got to spend some time with his daughter-in-law Jean. Um, it was fantastic. The world's best photographers were actually at that conference for winter in Yosemite, which was phenomenal. Jack Curran, um, Tim Cooper, I'm going to forget everybody. It doesn't matter. Leave that part <laughs> out. But world-class photographers. But the most interesting thing is there was no snow. Oh. So even though I'm a winter photographer, sometimes you have to be prepared to not have the weather and conditions that you're expecting. Oh, yeah. So that can happen. Wow. Yeah. 
You know, I, now that you say that, I lived in Michigan. I, I was raised in Michigan, and then I moved to Florida when I, I turned 19 on the way. Mm -hmm. But then I moved back to Michigan for a few years in my mm -hmm. 20s, and I went cross-country skiing for the first time, and I, I loved it. I thought it was so much fun. So I got cross-country skis, mm -hmm. and it never snowed again on the weekend, because I only had weekends. <laughs> of course. It only snowed <laughs> on Monday, and then it was gone by Friday. Yes. And so, yeah, I, I understand that, will that a little happen. bit. Because I wanted, the only time I ever wanted snow in my life. And this, uh, but you know what? Let's start with how do you prepare? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you need... How do you t how do you take care of your gear? What do you wear? Let's just go kind of through that. Let's Prepare, say I'm going to yeah. take. What's your next trip in the winter? Um, it will be winter Yellowstone again. And we do that, that one every year. We do that in January, 2021. Mm -hmm. And you have mm -hmm. openings. January yeah, we're about to open a couple of them for registration. So, and then Canadian Rockies, and then okay. well, I'm not sure where else. Well, let's <laughs> We've say a lot. let's say I'm yeah. Well, let's say Heather's going on a trip with you because okay. you know I'm not going. It's too cold. <laughs> All right. So if this is your first winter photography workshop or trip, it's really important to prepare and to prepare well. Um, one of the first things that you need to do is actually get the appropriate clothing. Um, winter is is brutal and it is very unforgiving so you have to consider all of your clothing everything from your base layers down to your outer layers so what I recommend is getting some really great base layers merino wool something breathable something that can dry very quickly so I have base layers and then we have mid layers sometimes a breathable fleece or something that'll keep you nice and warm and then we get to our outer layers nice um, synthetic down jack synthetic jackets or down jackets and then some Gore-Tex to go over top I wear snow pants um, I have multiple hats that's a key multiple hats and multiple gloves those are two things that are going to become wet if it's snowing you have to be able to change your hats and gloves so I travel with three pair of gloves wool gloves and I also travel with two to three different hats I'm a hat person so I've got a lot of character hats if I want to see wools I wear my wolf hat you know whatever it is so anyway um, that Plus, you have to have really good boots. Um, I wear snow boots, but I also have snow hiking boots, depending on the location I go to. If I'm in Yellowstone, the snow is much deeper, and I require some really good snow boots. I also put spikes on them, so there are different kinds of spikes. You can get tracks, you can get heavy duty spikes for very deep snow and ice, and you could get some mid-range ones. I actually carry all three types. Now, if I'm somewhere else, say I'm in the Canadian Rockies where the snow isn't going to be as deep and I'm photographing ice bubbles, then I'll take along some hiking boots that are snow hikers instead of snow boots. They're a little bit different. They're not quite as insulated, but they're much easier to walk on. So each location is going to vary a little bit. Um, I will say that this year um, I was given a heated vest <laughs> as a gift, and I tried it out in Norway when we had 50 mile per hour gusts of wind and it was very very cold and I said okay I'm gonna try this gift and it just saved the day now they come with batteries so I, I understand you know that that's something we may not want to do but having an emergency backup heated item is not necessarily a bad idea I travel with hand inserts, you know, the warming inserts for emergency. Um, I also have inserts I can put in my boot that will last 8 to 10 hours. And that's really important because your toes are going to get cold. Your nose is going to get cold. In fact, I wear a balaclava. You can't even tell who I am when I'm out there. I mean, you see this much of me, a little bit of my nose, and I'm completely covered in everything. And what was the word you just balaclava. used? Balaclava. 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 It's pretty much just a face mask, so you would only want to wear it in the winter. Don't drive around in your car <laughs> with it on because you're going to look scary. Um, but it is really important to cover things. Your extremities, your fingers, toes, and your nose and your ears are going to be the first thing that get frostbite. So you have to be very careful about that. Now, I remember, and I, I can't remember who it was, but it was, it was when I first started the show. It was an early guest talking about um, boots and they rate boots mm -hmm. for temperature 
They do. So if you know the temperature, the average lowest temperature of a location you're going to, you can choose your boots by that. So I do, because I do a lot of lo locations in the winter, I have multiple boots. I have some that go down to minus 30. Well, if they're going to minus 30 and I'm going somewhere that just hovers around zero, I'm going to get hot. And getting overheated is not necessarily a good thing because then you know, you could easily get into hypothermia. So anytime you go on a trip, there's a lot of factors. Um, if you are not doing a workshop, but you're traveling on your own, you can always go to an outdoor store such as REI. They're very helpful. Mm -hmm. They tell you, you know, what kind of boots you might need for a certain temperature, clothing and stuff like that. Do you have like favorite brands? I do. Well, I'm a prana influencer, so I use a lot of prana for my regular stuff, but they don't make the outdoor gear um, that I need. But I do have both REI and Patagonia Nano Puff jackets rated for different temperatures. And um, Arcteryx is what I use for my um, Gore-Tex gear. Uh -huh. I have a parka. And just that over top of a nano puff and some base layers does the trick. And then for boots, I use the Baffin boots, which I think are fantastic. Um, Merrill, I have some Merrill. Do I have a favorite? No, I have a favorite for each specific thing. Oh, for each yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, I think the key is is to make sure they're waterproof, to make sure you have multiple socks and gloves. Um, I was given a pair of gloves called A gloves that are available um, at a couple of photo locations, photo stores, and also on Amazon, and they're $20. And someone gave them to me after a winter trip, and they're pure wool, and I gotta say, they keep me warmer than any yeah. other glove I've had. And I mean, I've got a whole bin of gloves at home. Okay. So shop around, ask advice. A lot of us that do winter workshops, we've obviously tried just about everything right. to be comfortable. Yeah. See, I didn't even know that they rated for temperature. They do. Like that. Absolutely. I feel bad. I can't remember who told me that, but I was so surprised by that. <laughs> uh, and he was, you know, testing for some company. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so what about our gear? Yeah. You know, the camera gear, um, the type of gear you take is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to take a solid tripod in winter because you need stability. Although in winter time, I always recommend um, either ice claws for the feet or spikes because that'll keep you stable. Um, but a heavy tripod is actually really important because what comes along with winter, one of course snow, sometimes a lot of wind, gale force wind sometimes. Um, so you have to have stability, whether it's landscape or wildlife. And when I'm traveling, um, I have my backpack. I have a cover for my backpack in case it is snowing, um, a rainproof cover. Okay. Um, I also have some extra cleaning dry cloths. So REI sells some, well, obviously, camping supplies. So I get their camp washcloths, which are about that big. And they're really nice soft material, but allows me to draw, dry off the camera or any equipment okay. from the outside, kind of dampen it. Um, get the dew off of the equipment should it get wet. And it's ultimately going to get wet at times, whether it's blowing snow, whether it's a little bit of sleet. We had hail um, <laughs> this year, which was very painful oh in the face. Gosh. But uh, it's wonderful. The photos you get, you just can't replace it. You just have to be prepared. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, protecting your gear becomes an issue, of course, but I still travel with a wide angle, a mid-range, a telephoto, and then a super telephoto if there's going to be wildlife. Okay. And if there are northern lights, I'm going with, you know, prime lenses like a 14, um, a 24. It just depends, again, on the location. And what you're doing, mm -hmm. too, right. And I always recommend always a backup camera because ultimately in moisture conditions and especially in cold conditions your camera has the potential of saying i'm done for the day and uh. it may boot right up again tomorrow but i travel with three bodies because i've seen it every single trip somebody's camera will ultimately say no more today. And that's because of the condensation? Is that why? Or? I don't know if it's really condensation. I guess it could be building inside a little bit. It is a moisture um, rich environment. Um, but no, I would say it's probably more the cold. It doesn't like cold. Camera okay. equipment becomes brittle in the cold too. Okay. So you have to be very careful. Lens hoods will break and crack. Um, you have to handle everything very gently because it is 
a lot of plastic. Yeah. Plastic becomes very brittle when it's extremely cold and you have to do your best to protect it. But sometimes you can't protect everything. So multiple camera bodies are very important. So do you just put the camera right out there? And unless it, if it's snowing, mm -hmm. do you cover it with rain gear? Or? Actually, sometimes if it's a long lens, I can put um, covers over the lenses, which are helpful. But I have found that the most valuable tool for winter photography is a really good umbrella, one that allows the wind to come ah. through. Because you can hold it over top of you, or you can even get a clamp, an umbrella clamp, and it keeps everything off of your camera while you're shooting. Now, it may not protect you as you're going back to your snow coach, or your van, or your four-wheel drive, or whatever it is you're mm -hmm. transporting in. Um, but it is a valuable tool. Okay. I do recommend, actually, um, one thing to keep cameras safe while you're going from your transportation to your shooting location is that you use a padded bag. Okay. Because I think sometimes people like to go light, they use a backpack, say I'm just gonna take one lens, I'm gonna put it in there, simple backpacks. They're not really protecting anything. But a padded bag has a little bit of insulation in there. Okay, it's so protecting the elements okay. better. So I always I always recommended a padded bag okay, that makes, for winter. Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. And do what if you do get condensation on your lens? Does that happen often when you're out there? Mm, or? It does sometimes. Um, the more snow coming down or the more right. rain, if it happens to be rain, that can happen. Um, the umbrella can help protect moisture on the lens. Also, it's very important, condensation or even frost can develop on a lens a lot of times when you're pointed up. Um, so if the lens is pointed up, a lot of times it gets more condensation on it. And it can also happen around some of the geysers if you're in Yellowstone. So what I recommend for that, one, is you never scrape frost off of a lens, never. You just put that in your bag and you let it defrost. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen that happen very often, just a couple of times in all the trips I've taken to Yellowstone. Okay. Okay. But moisture will develop, so I keep a lot of extra lens cleaning cloths in every pocket I have. I can just, you know, touch it very gently, make sure it's not frozen. If it's just water, okay. then I can just wipe it off. But I go through multiple lens cloths on each shoot okay. if it is snowing or if I'm near the geysers. Okay, so yeah. bring lens cloths. <laughs> a lot of them. And that's what, you know, the dashboard is covered with lens cloths drawing. Oh, because you yeah, know. we got to dry them off. Yeah, that's exactly. Right. Any reason. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what about um, battery life? It, it, oh, well, one thing I've noticed with uh, a lot more people changing to mirrorless cameras is that the battery life is going quite quickly, especially oh, yeah. on those cameras. Now, the the other cameras, the you know Canon, Nikon, and other DSLR cameras, their battery life is still pretty good. Ultimately, the cold weather will affect it. So you have to be able to travel with other batteries, extra batteries. And what I do is I keep them in my backpack um, in compartments wrapped in towels or small towels just to try and get a little more insulation in there. But I also keep one or two on my body inside of a pocket. So if it's next to my body, it's going to get some of the body heat in there, one of the inner layers, the Gore-Tex is on the outside, and that helps extend the battery life. But batteries, especially for mirrorless cameras, when we're doing a winter workshop, I say plan on six batteries a day. Wow. Yes. Yes. That's that's a lot of batteries. Because yes. <laughs> I think I, I don't even change my battery in one day. Yeah. I normally well, I would not either. If it's sure. my professional. I do yeah. have a little point and shoot type uh -huh. of, like a bridge camera, that uh -huh. thing, that battery goes like crazy. Absolutely. So, <laughs> all right. So let, is there anything else about preparation we should know or about that I missed? Well, if I think of something, I'll shout yeah. it out. But okay. at the moment, I think. <laughs> okay. That was pretty good. Yeah. I and think. Now, I, Let's, let's say now I'm out there. Mm -hmm. Everything is white. Yes. Is my meter going to be accurate when I'm sitting? No, no, not exactly. <laughs> okay. um, well, your meter is going, if you're using your camera's built-in meter, it is going to measure um, the white as a gray. And I, I imagine it's somewhere around 18%, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even up to 50%. But it is going to read the white as gray. So what do we do about that? Um, we end up actually having to overexpose. So using the meter is not an effective way in winter conditions to judge your exposure. The most important thing you can use is your histogram. Oh. 
So histograms have to be accurate. Um, and you have to make sure you're not blowing out the whites. That's the most important thing because you can recover when you're processing. You can pull down the highlights a little bit or exposure a tiny bit if you need to, but you cannot overexpose. But you also can't underexpose either. So you have to find that nice range in the center without overexposing. So do you usually shoot in live view so you can see the histogram? Or can you see the um, histogram through your viewfinder? I can see histograms through the viewfinder. I can also see them in live. So as long as you're doing either that, looking at the histogram while you're photographing, I think that's important. Or two, I use an eye cup when I'm looking through my lens so I can block out. It's a creative technique where I block out everything except what's, you know, Right. through the lens. Uh -huh. A little old fashioned there. I don't rely on my live view so much. But I look through it. I also go and review the image when I'm photographing, especially the first couple that I'm doing in a scene. Right. And right there, I can hit the photo, and I can make sure I see the histogram there, and I know if I need to make any adjustments. Yeah, because I can't see the histogram through my viewfinder, and that's mm -hmm. how I prefer to take a mm -hmm. picture, because I Mm -hmm. They didn't even have live view when I started, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, mean, so, I mean, I use it sometimes, but uh -huh. I'm not. I'm not. It's not my. I'm not right. as comfortable with it. And I'm not either. But there is a tool. It's a valuable tool. The one thing I can say is, a lot of times, if it's sunny and snow it's too bright to see your histogram. You and we run into anyway. that, not just in winter, but other times, of course. Yeah. But that's why I like to rely on a high eye cup, a hoodman, or something like that, okay. to be able to make sure that histogram is correct. To me, that is the only way I can guarantee I am not blowing out the snow and I'm not underexposing. That's, okay, that's mm -hmm. good, that is really good. And what about the people who don't shoot in the manual mode? Okay, so I shoot in the manual mode, it's really easy for me to say, sure. okay, I'm gonna, just adjust for my histogram, but what mm -hmm. about somebody who shoots an aperture priority? What do they do? I would say you'd have to rely on exposure compensation. Okay. And, and you can do that. There are a couple of things you can do. If you're on aperture priority, you can underexpose or overexpose, usually by three stops either way. You can also choose to bracket in some circumstances, especially if it's a landscape photo. Um, that's not so easy with wildlife. One of the things we encounter with wildlife, um, say the the bison in Yellowstone. They're very, very dark. The snow is very, very white. Right. What do you do in that case? You have to be careful not to blow out your white. So you actually have to find a balance between underexposing the snow so it's not blowing out, but also not getting a um, underexposed bison. So yeah. you have to pay attention. Usually you'll see your histogram has big spikes on it, right? It's like the letter M because you're getting a lot of white, you're getting a lot of dark. Um, but, so but that the histogram, Basically, you don't want anything crawling up either side. Exactly. Right? You so just don't want to be on the ends. You don't want to be bunched up on the ends. Okay. You cannot have, you know, total blacks. You can't have total whites. You have to find some happy medium there, knowing you're going to have a lot of light, white, bright color, a lot of dark color. Yeah. And I would say that most of those images, when it comes to a dark animal in the snow, um, you're going to have to rely on skills and processing to bring down your highlights, bring up your shadows to actually make that photo work. But as long as your histogram says you didn't under or overexpose it, if you're in the middle somewhere, mm -hmm. you should be able to make it into a nice photo when exactly. you get back into Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever. Okay. Exactly. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. All right, what about white balance? Does, yeah. Do you have to do a custom you know, white balance? Or? I get asked that quite a bit. And okay. I will say that I always use auto white balance. Now, with that being said, snow can often look blue at certain times of day, especially um, early morning, late afternoon. Yeah. Um, in the blue hour, it looks blue. Um, on the other hand, if it's sunny out, your snow looks yellow and you don't want that. <laughs> um, but personally, I'm very comfortable with choosing auto white balance and then making adjustments when I get to processing. And I use Lightroom for my processing, so it's very easy for me to take a look at the temperature slider on the snow images, and I can select one photo from a scene, I can make a temperature adjustment. Sometimes I'll just go to the auto button and see what Lightroom tells me to do. And if it looks good or getting closer to where I want it to be, I can use the slider from there. Okay, so auto white, but you're shooting I in do. raw. Always in RAW, always, absolutely. And if you are um, new to RAW or not comfortable using it yet, I do recommend that you shoot in RAW plus JPEG because you don't have the ability to change 
um, realistically a lot of the temperature or the settings in a JPEG as you would if you were processing in RAW. What about a polarizer filter? Do you use a polarizing filter? You know, sometimes I do. Is there a lot of glare? Not so much. Okay. I'll tell you where I do find glare, and sometimes this helps. If I'm around the geyser area, there's a lot of water um, and colors under the water. So using a polarizer can really help bring those colors out. Ah. And even sometimes if the bison are very wet and shiny, they're coming out of the river, they're crossing a river and coming towards you, they have a shiny color to their coat that needs to be toned down a little bit. So if you have enough light and the, the extra stops of the polarizer don't you know, slow down your speed too much, then I would put a polarizer on. Okay. Same with the ice bubbles when we're up in the Canadian Rockies. You know, you're going to see them better if you can adjust a polarizer a little bit. Works better with landscape than it does wildlife, but that really comes down to how much it affects the speed of your photograph. Because with wildlife, you, you know this, birds, wildlife, you need really, really fast photos they to don't, stop they don't motion. around for you? No. <laughs> And once in a while, you'll get the one that's just laying there by himself, just staring at you. Um, but usually they like to move a little yeah, they, bit. They don't, care about, they don't care if you get your picture, do they? No. <laughs> All right, so say I'm doing a landscape of just white hills, but it's pretty to my eye. <laughs> but now how am I going to... Where am I going to focus? What am I going to do? Okay, you already told me that I need to look at my histogram so I don't mm -hmm. under or overexpose it. Mm -hmm. Is it just like any other landscape photography where you would focus a third of the way in? or? I think it, it really depends on the scene that you're photographing. So let's say, for instance, it's almost all white. You've got some nice hills and curves um, that may be getting a little bit of light or sunlight that mm -hmm. just separate it from the background snow. If you don't have contrast, you have to find a place for contrast. Okay. The nice thing about snow, for the most part, winter photography, um, in many locations, the depth of field is very different because you have snow in the foreground. Um, maybe a little, you know, glitter and glare from some frost, which is nice, gives okay. you, you know, a little bit of speckles, which is very pretty. And everything's off in the distance, as opposed to when you don't have snow and everything right here is very important as far as, you know, your hyperfocal distance and getting it all in focus. Winter's a little more forgiving in most situations. Um, if you're photographing ice bubbles, that's a little different. You're low to the ground, it, you know, and you are focusing about one third into the shot or knowing your hyperfocal distance is very crucial. Okay to getting everything in focus, or even focus stacking, which I see some people doing. Um, but ultimately, photographing in winter, in most cases, comes around to the creative style of minimalism. So there has to be something other than just pure white out there to focus on. It could be a tree off in the distance that's a little dark or a bison. It could be um, the curve of a hill, like I said, has a nice shine of light around it and you pick that spot to focus on. You have to look for the contrast and you have to be able to move your focal point inside the camera to put it on that so that it actually is in focus. Okay, okay, that's really good advice because that, <laughs> I think it's it's hard sometimes for people to find that right composition, mm -hmm. and it could be just the light giving that little bit of separation. Separation exactly. is an important, <laughs> you know, it, important part of composition. Absolutely, and forget about it. Absolutely. But so so now, when when do you go out and photograph? Is it the same time, like mornings mm -hmm. and nights or afternoons? Because the, the sun is different, the light is softer in the winter, right? So what's wonderful about winter are the extended hours of winter light. So we are able to go out for extended sunrises, extended sunsets, you get that wonderful glow. Now I do want to say that there are times we can photograph all day because even if it's not sunny, if we're getting absolutely no sun and it's very stark and wintry, we get some of the best photographs. Um, because we're going for a real minimalist effect. Um, so you can photograph wildlife all day. You can still photograph ice bubbles. You can photograph trees that have you know, all this beautiful snow on them. So a lot of times winter photography goes from 
before the sun comes up until after the sun goes down. And there's multiple things you can do. It really does depend on the weather. That's, that is interesting. So you can photograph all day long and you've, got a, you've just got a softer light. Exactly. Right? You do. Now, maybe during the midday, if it's an extremely bright day, no clouds in the sky, no precipitation, no anything, it can, it can be as challenging, maybe even a little more challenging to photograph in winter because the light hitting the snow just blows it out. That's about the only time we can't photograph in winter um, successfully or okay. landscapes. That's when you start looking for details and looking for how the snow lives hits the the light hits the snow and maybe what kind of shapes you can find snow on rocks in the in the river um, things like that there's oh, a lot to okay. do yeah and the the different times of day I would imagine well it's just like any time the, the color of the light changes too right mm -hmm. so it's more yellow in the morning and <laughs> more blue in the afternoon and I actually I find it strangely a little more blue in the morning as well but I think that's just because it's all white and before the sun comes up, it does have that blue tint. Then the sun does come up and hits it, and it becomes a little more yellow at that okay. point. Oh, that, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then if, if there is no sun whatsoever, it's white. It's white and, and you, what other color you're photographing. Do you correct that, like to make it white, or do you mm -hmm. like the yellowish or bluish or... Or just depends I, on the picture. I, th I do think it depends on what you're photographing. Um, so, for instance, if the sun is peeking through and there's some steam coming behind some trees and having that golden light come through, then having the snow a little warm is very, very nice. Um, but oftentimes, if it's an early shot or a later shot and there's a little too much blue and there's no sun, I, I tend to correct that. Okay. I find that, just personally, a little wrong. All right, you wrong. just... <laughs> To me, you just made me think of something. Do you have a lot of um, like mist, or I don't know what? Am, what am I looking for? What's the word? It it and could be mist. It could that? be fog. I, isn't is that oh, hard to photograph? No, not at all. In fact, this year in Yellowstone, one of the most beautiful moments for winter photography I'd seen. There was actually a winter storm approaching. So this is something we always look for. Always watching for weather. We know storms are coming in. It was coming in at sunset, so all the clouds were out. Um, and the sun was peeking through it and it was highlighting all the trees on the ridges uh, uh, in Lamar Valley. Made some of the most beautiful photos. We would underexpose some so the light was the subject. We would overexpose and use minimalism where the trees were just peeking through. So just like any other landscape um, experience, you can, you can plan your day around the light and the weather to get some really dramatic photos. Have you ever been stuck out there when a storm came? Or, I mean, <laughs> I sounds kind yeah, of scary to yeah, me. Yeah, a little bit. I've been you're out. <laughs> you're out like in the middle of nowhere, right? Sometimes we've had whiteout conditions at times, and you just have to put your blinkers on and and kind of hunker down. I think when you're photographing in a winter location, you need to know the roads. You need to know the area very well. You need good maps in your car flashlights of course um, emergency blankets i keep everything in a winter pack that is an emergency um, rescue type backpack so it's going to have extra clothing extra socks if feet get wet it's going to have an extra shirt if you get wet in the field you have to get in um, just the risk of hypothermia is too great so I keep extra clothes. I keep, you know, the emergency foil blankets oh, yeah, because yeah, you can yeah. wrap up in those if you need to. Um, flashlight, you can keep uh, anything out there, your blinkers, your flares, anything like that that are in the vehicle in case you needed them. But if you're in a whiteout condition, there's not much you could do other than change on your hazard lights and just kind of hold still. But you're not the only one, so everybody's pretty much stopped okay. at that point, okay. except the wildlife. They, they don't mind. They don't mind it. <laughs> I don't think they, don't they hunker do. They do somewhere? Not so much. Wow. I've seen, you know, I'll be sitting in a car and a bison will walk by and you can barely see them. He's like, what? Yeah. Is this I know. snowing? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice. I know. This is nothing. <laughs> I lived in Syracuse for one winter. Wow. And I never forget it because, you know, I'm from Michigan. It snows in Michigan, but not mm -hmm. like it does in Syracuse. <laughs> and the people, I was like, oh my gosh, it's yeah. a blizzard. And they're like, just use your snowmobile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, everybody had a snowmobile. <laughs> <laughs> like, no big deal. Oh, my God. That's 
why I'm staying in Florida, or I'm staying <laughs> somewhere warm anyway. Jeez. So, okay, so now you obviously like the wildlife. You've I do. You've mentioned that mm -hmm. several times. Mm -hmm. But what about, do you like, like big vast landscapes when it's oh. all white, or is it better to find the intimate scenes? I think in winter there's opportunity for everything. So of course you have wildlife opportunities. What makes them so great in winter is they're very noticeable as opposed to maybe other times of the year you don't see the wildlife coming out of the tree or something yeah, because they they're... blend in, they're camouflaged. Right. You don't have that in winter, so it's noticeable and so your subjects, you can see them. You can get to where they are if, as long as you're not you know, invading their space. You put your long telephoto lens on, I like my 800 for winter. Um, but you can get some really great photos um, of wildlife. But I love the landscapes. Just having that really nice open white stark landscape with maybe a few dark trees is really a beautiful photo. And there are so many opportunities for isolation and simplicity and minimalism. You know, just one snowy tree with frost on it or, you know, maybe something just the frost itself. Finding patterns and textures mm. in the snow and the frost and the ice can be incredibly challenging creatively and fun. So much to do in winter. I don't know if anyone really realizes it. I didn't realize it until I started photographing winter. I just cannot get enough of it. Wow, that yeah. is something else. Yeah. Jeez. What about, um, you just talked about animals being camouflaged. Aren't there like white animals? Are there? there are some. I haven't seen them. Oh, you haven't seen them? <laughs> <laughs> I've been tracking a snowshoe hare in Yellowstone for a very long time. You see their tracks everywhere. They're very fresh. And, you know, I just take my time and I look and I look and then the tracks disappear and you know he's there looking at you. Yeah, but you, <laughs> but you can't him. see him. Aww. No. <laughs> I just, I, I'm just thinking of those pictures. I think they're, they, I don't know where these, where, where do the snowy owls live? They're like in Canada or yeah. something, right? Yeah. But you see them on the white, in the white snow. And, and some of the pictures that I've seen, the photographers are just so good at it. And it yeah. seems like it would be really hard to even find the contrast on the bird to focus. Yeah. But. yeah it's surprising. It's not as hard as, as you would think. Yeah. You just have to find a contrast point. Yeah. Whether it's dark to light, whether it's a highlight, there there is something you can use to focus your camera and lens. But it, it, is, it is something, though, that you know, I, I teach a lot of beginners, mm -hmm. and they come with these really cheap lenses, and they don't understand that, you know, we, we don't, it's not that we want to carry the heavy <laughs> lens no. around, that we right. want to spend all that money, but it will, a nice lens is going to focus faster, it's going to find contrast more mm -hmm. easily, it's going to, you know, there's a reason to buy a more expensive lens, and if this is the type of stuff you want to do, mm -hmm. if you're trying to do things without a lot of contrast, you're probably going to need a better lens. I have learned um, from not only experience, but from seeing what other people bring to the workshops that having good equipment is extremely important. And if it's something that you don't want to purchase or not ready to purchase, there are always lens rental opportunities. LensRental.com, I use them all the time. Um, and I have all the equipment, but I may want multiples of something. Why? I don't know, but I want to have everything with me. You would think I just carry too much, maybe. I, I was just going to ask you, <laughs> how, how much, I, I know we use bar, borrow lenses. I know I've used them many times. Uh -huh. And then, of course, the Canon Professional mm -hmm. Services, you can get lenses uh, from them, exactly. too. Exactly. How much stuff do you bring? For winter, I bring a lot. Um, I try and get it all into one suitcase that contains my clothing and my two tripods. I always carry two tripods um, in, in the boots. And, and you check that with the mm -hmm. two, you check the two mm -hmm. tripods, but not your gear. Your gear. No, goes on my your bag. camera gear I carry. Okay. So I have a really nice think tank roller bag that will carry um, a lot of my equipment, uh -huh. and then I have my backpack. Um, there are times if I have too much gear that I will just have it sent out to where I'm going okay. and I can pick it up at a FedEx location and that way it's there for me and I just return it when I'm done. Because traveling, especially with large lenses, it can be a little difficult and you use them a lot for wildlife almost anywhere you go. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the ability to carry all that equipment on the plane, then you definitely want to make sure that you're shipping it to where you are or at least a FedEx location near you. 
I remember one time I was coming back from, I think it was the Grand Tetons with an 800 millimeter lens. And one of these things where you have to run from one plane to the other, right? Mm. Your, your worst nightmare, 800 lens, a backpack, and you are just run, run, running, hoping to make a flight because the flight is late. And I get on, I'm the last person on the flight and I have an 800 lens that I'm carrying and there's nowhere to put it. And I said the, to the flight attendant, may I please put this in your cabinet? I told her what it was and the value of it. And she's like, no. And I, I begged, <laughs> no. it didn't happen. I got off the plane. Really? I did, because I'm not gonna leave an 800 lens, you know, to be checked on the side of the plane. No, you no know, way. I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> but wow. that's just me, I don't know. So did you lose the, did you get a, I, I got off the plane and they rebooked me on another one, but I wasn't I wasn't going to okay. risk it. Yeah, I no. know. The last time we traveled with, you know, some I don't remember where we went, but one of the ladies had three carry-ins. Really? Why did she have three carry-ins? One of our ladies, you know, who was on our oh. trip. So of course they stopped her. Yeah. And and it was all her gear Just and she gear. was like but fortunately, she was with a bunch of us, and we took her gear and put it, like, crammed it in our <laughs> stuff, which was already jam-packed mm -hmm. to the gills. But I'll tell you, I think I need to start doing little checks on the people when that, why, why, three carry-ons? You can't do that. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> and she thought, her, I guess she thought her purse wouldn't count, but it was a massive purse. Uh -huh. So yeah. They've become very strict, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. All right, so what if, what if we're doing um, any kind of winter photography with snow and we, we want to convert it? Well, I don't know. How would we know if we, that this would look good or in, better in black and white? Hmm. Do we know that ahead of time or do we play around with it later? That's a great question. Um, some people can look at a scene and say, I know this is going to be black and white. So. If I look at a scene that doesn't have a lot of color to begin with, I know that I'm going to convert it to black and white. So okay. if it is very stark and the trees are very dark, then, then I know that's what I'm working towards. Okay. But if there's color, if there's some blue in the sky, if there's some nice light, I may not go black and white with that. I may stay with color. So I think it's just a matter of the lighting situation and the style that you prefer. But I would say almost anything you photograph could be converted to black and white and done very well if you know how to process black and white photography. But that is one of the nice things about winter photography is that it is minimalist. This gives you the opportunity to do a lot of really beautiful black and white, high key photographs if you have a lot of snow and just a little bit of color or a little bit of trees, something dark. Um, makes beautiful minimalistic photos and you can do them in high key so you've got a lot of white and something just a little bit dark. You could also reverse that thinking so say you're along a river that's naturally dark but you have some fog coming up off of the river you can do a very dark black and white photo where you increase your white so that the fog is more prominent and it may actually highlight some of the dark trees or rocks that are in the okay. in the stream. That sounds cool. Yeah. Now when you're framing, do you frame or do you use gallery wraps? It seems, I don't know. To me, I'm picturing that I think a, a snow picture would need to be framed with a black frame. But that's just maybe a little prejudice I have. I don't know. No. I, but I'm thinking a gallery wrap, which I love gallery wraps, uh -huh. but I'm thinking... I, think, I don't know. You, you kind of need an end if it's all white. Am it's, I wrong? No, I actually, I no actually wrong. hadn't considered. No, you're right. There is absolutely no yeah. wrong. It's personal preference. Um, but now that I think about it, the winter photos that I have printed, um, if they've been framed, they have been framed with a dark frame. Yeah. They have, and I never really it, realized that before. Yeah, you kind of, <laughs> yeah. I kind of maybe that brings you into the photo it more. It does. Instead of just sort of the photo just blending off or something. Exactly. I, I was just, I was just pop, that just popped into my <laughs> mind. All right, so give us tips for creative compositions in wintry yeah. landscapes. Well, let's see, there are so many. Um, when it comes to creative composition, the one thing that I always recommend that people do is they do a little bit of research. Research before you go to a location gives you an idea of what to expect. It gives you an idea of what other artists and photographers have done. 
I'm not encouraging anyone to copy, but we are a sharing community as photographers, and I think we can all learn from each other. So what's really nice is I research the weather, I research photography, photographers that I may follow, see what they've done. I try to get a sense of what can be done in a location, and from there I try and take it and put my own spin on it. Okay. So I always go into winter knowing that I'm going to accomplish different styles of photography. I'm going to get landscapes that are just beautiful. They're white, they're minimalistic. They're going to be focused on simplicity. I also know that I'm going to go in with a standard lens like my 24 to 105, which I use a great deal, and I'm going to really try and isolate very small details, a pine cone sticking out of the snow, um, and you know, it turned into a black and white, that can be extremely beautiful. There's also a lot of abstract possibilities. Okay. Yeah, especially when you come to a location or go to a location that has ice. Um, so for instance, just getting back from Norway, we had a lot of ice. We have a lot of ice in that location. So you get down to the edge of the water, use your tripod, make sure you're not gonna fall in the water and don't go alone because if you fall in the water, you need someone to help get you out, get you of course. <laughs> but um, being able to play with chunky ice, broken ice, frosty ice, looking for lines that you know are cracked in the ice will give you a leading line or a foreground detail to, okay. to be able to make a really nice landscape with some mountains in the background. Around. Um, what I look for most for winter and getting creative with is the weather because weather is really prominent in the winter months. No matter what location I go to, ultimately there's a storm. These mountains oftentimes create their own weather system. So you'll find you know, beautiful clouds that form over them or fog that goes between them. And that's when I pull out my one to 400 and I just have a happy day photographing the drama. I would say that to me, winter is more dramatic than, he, than any other season that I photograph. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So how about giving us a little wrap up? So we talked about the, your actual personal gear. Right. <laughs> And you have more gear than anyone in the entire <laughs> freaking world. I know. <laughs> I thought most women had a problem with shoes. You got too many boots, right? I do. I do. Um, but starting with being warm, that's really, really important. I think understanding that you're going into an area, a location where danger is much more present than other times of the year. You have to be able to regulate your body's temperature and you also have to pay attention to your your body and how it responds to the cold. If you're not accustomed to it, um, you have to look for things, you know, are you dizzy? Are you not feeling right? Are you shivering? Has your core become too cold to be comfortable? Um, if you're not thinking well, you need to tell somebody that you're with because these could be some of the first signs of danger where you need to get back in and get warmed up. Um, and having appropriate clothing really is important. So whoever you're going with, if you're going with somebody, make sure you get a gear list and a clothing recommendation list. And if you're going on your own, then go see the experts at one of the outdoor stores because they will help outfit you uh, for anything that you need for your conditions. Being comfortable, being warm, and being healthy in extreme temperatures is your first step to being creative because if you're worrying about not doing well or you're shivering or whatever it is, you're not getting out of the vehicle to do anything and all this magical winter wonderland is all around you. So you have to pay attention to the warning signs. Great, great mm -hmm. tip because you're right. If you're unhappy or in any way, your creativity is not going to soar. No, <laughs> not at all. And there's, there's so much out there to photograph in winter. All right, so getting dressed for that's the first thing. It sounds like a simple yes. thing, but it's a pretty big deal. Exactly. And then number two, how to, protecting your gear. Protecting your gear. Make sure you have a good backpack that is well lined. Make sure that you understand um, that you need extra batteries. Unfortunately, you do. A lot of extra batteries. <laughs> you really do. You need a lot of lens cleaning cloths and some nice cloths that you can wipe your camera down with when it does get damp. And I don't really wipe my camera, but if it is snowing and I'm out there and I don't have my umbrella with me as I should, mm -hmm. then, you know, I just pull it out of my backpack, I dampen it off, and I, and I go and get back into my transportation, whatever I'm in. 
and I do a thorough drying. Um, okay. Another thing I want to mention when you get back to your room after photographing in winter, the temperatures are very cold, so you have to let your equipment acclimate. I don't keep the heat on in the rooms while I am out and about and shooting, and I don't turn it on for a while either. I actually allow myself to be acclimated to cooler temperatures. You have to do that with your camera equipment as well, because if you go into a really hot hotel room after you've been out in freezing temperatures, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to develop condensation in your gear. Yeah, you're right. So you have to be careful about that. Isn't that funny? I have such I the opposite problem here you in Florida do. because <laughs> if I have to, if I go outside and it's hot and uh -huh. muggy and I come in the air conditioning, that's my problem. Exactly. <laughs> so it's just reversed. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's that is very good advice though. Ooh, God, it makes me not want to go even more. <laughs> Because it's like, at least I'll be back to a warm hotel room. No, it's cold. <laughs> no, you got to stay cold the whole time. <laughs> All right, so we talked about your clothing protecting your gear. Mm -hmm. What was the next thing? We oh, talked your histogram. About histogram and metering and white balance. Auto your white balance. Your, mm -hmm. your hit, but learning to, to, to shoot by your histogram. You really need to learn that a instead histogram. Of your, like for me, you know, I teach this class a lot, mm -hmm. how to shoot in the manual mode. Your meter, your meter, your meter, your meter. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, no. not your meter, not your meter, not your meter, your no, histogram. it's your histogram. You so, have to know if you're blowing out your whites or the snow. Because and the meter's not going to be really giving mm -mm. you an accurate reading. The meter cannot give you an accurate reading. Okay. It cannot. You can, you can meter, but it <laughs> doesn't mean it's going to be accurate. So right. you have to rely on the histogram to make sure you're not blowing out your whites. Because, of course, if you blow them out, you're not going to be able to recover. And then the next point you made was you have to find co some, some mm -hmm. contrast. Mm -hmm. Find some contrast to make... Your focus point, I guess, your mm -hmm. focal point of the picture. Exactly. There's contrast somewhere. You're not just photographing uh, a whiteout condition, a white screen. There's going to be contrast somewhere. And it may be very subtle, but you look for it, you find it, and you move your focal point inside the camera and you put it on that contrasty point and you should be able to get focus. Okay. I always recommend, no matter whether it's winter or anything else, if you're photographing and you're not sure if you have focus, then take the photo, zoom in, make sure you're getting focus before you stop shooting that location, and, and you'll know. You won't go home saying, oh gosh, I didn't get it in focus. This I know, beautiful scene. That's a good, that is good advice. And I like your, also your advice because I do the same thing, especially when I'm doing studio lighting. Uh -huh. If I'm doing studio, let's say I'm photographing, I do a lot of headshots in my studio, right? Mm -hmm. The first shot I take, I zoom in and I look to make sure every, the lighting's where I want it, the mm -hmm. shadow's not like on a funny part of their nose or something. <laughs> And I zoom in, I look at the picture, and then I keep going. Yes. And you said the same thing. Exactly. Zoom in on the first picture, study it, make sure that everything looks good, make sure you're not overexposing exactly. in parts. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. that's your biggest worry, mm -hmm. it sounds like, in it is. photography. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your light. The light's not going to change that drastically that quickly, right? No. So. Typically not. You know, typically you get a little bit of sun. And the nice thing about winter is it does change throughout the day. I don't think there's one winter location I go to where you wake up and it's the same all day. It, you get a lot of weather with winter. So you may have a little bit of sun and a lot of cloud and then some snow and then a little more sun. And, you know, you just have to be prepared for everything. Okay. And what else? Is that... Did I miss anything on our little summary? I don't <laughs> think so. I just would say that, you know, winter photography, I, I know I've said this, but it is so much fun. It's creatively challenging. I recommend that everybody try it. Um, I think you might find that you like it. Even if you don't like cold, I never liked cold, <laughs> but I love the photography. And now that I'm geared up appropriately, um, I don't feel the cold, really, in most cases, I don't. Yeah. So I, it's I actually a new learned palette. a lot about clothing from you just now today. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. didn't realize, you know, that you, I didn't realize you could get too hot. Yes, you can. You, if you get hot, um, if, you're, if your temperature 
inside your layers gets too warm, you could perspire. And then when you get back out, if you're actually wet or damp, yeah. then you could get cold and that's very bad. So you really have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to your clothing. You have to pay attention to your body. If you're getting wet, you go sit in the vehicle that you came in because most people are not hiking in these conditions, though some people will cross country ski, snowmobile or snowshoe. Um, if you're doing that, then you should be going with a guided person who is trained in that kind of um, winter landscape photography because there are a lot more risks than yeah. maybe just driving yourself to some of the photo locations wow. in one of the wonderful winter parks. Jeez. Yeah. So what's coming up next for you, for you Jennifer? We're, we're, this is airing um, just next week, so. Yeah, well, just back from all the winter, so happy to be in Florida, like I said, and get to warm up. Um, wow. I've got Death Valley, which will be nice and warm. I do that every year, of course. It's hot, isn't it? Yeah. So you're going from all your winter to Death Valley? You got it. I'm going to be in summer for well, between Florida and Death Valley and then into spring we've got all of our spring workshops lined up summer workshops back into fall of course we we do Acadia and we do um, Smoky Mountains I'm over by the Smoky so we do that every year and then back off to winter again and I hate to say it but I can't wait oh my gosh it's so funny <laughs> I know and and how do how does the audience find you what's your website jenniferkingphoto.com jenniferkingphoto.com mm -hmm. And I'm not even going to ask you to spell that because I bet people can spell that. <laughs> it's an easy one. <laughs> I bet you got that a long time ago, though. I did. Because Jennifer King is... It's a common name, and there are a lot of photographers out there with that name I'm learning. Uh, but yeah, it's Jennifer. Jennifer King Photo. Um, there are many... It's when a common I was name. Doing, when I should I was change doing, my name. When I was doing weddings, I don't remember what year it was, but I had... I think I had six Jennifer brides that year. They were oh, all wow. about your age. I'm looking at you. They were probably your age at the time, whatever age the Jennifers were. <laughs> and I think four of them were Jennifer and Jason together. Wow, really? Because Jason was the boy's name oh, at that time. Oh, my gosh. Time. <laughs> wow. What a coincidence. JenniferKingPhoto.com. Yes. And, of course, the PFABC. I know we've talked about that before, pfabc.org. So that is the fundraiser founded in 2013, uh, Photography for the Fight Against Breast Cancer. And since we started that in 2013, um, wonderful photographers like Art Wolf and Tony Sweet have come on board to help us raise money for the fight against breast cancer. So they've been on board for a few years with us now. and. And we continue to raise money for that. So I hope that everyone will pass the word on pfabc.org and get involved. And as photographers, we can help all of our friends and family in the photographic community, um, as well as around the world. Awesome, awesome. You're doing good things. Thank you. <laughs> and staying warm. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you for being on the Understand Thanks, Photography Peggy. Show again. It's so great to see you It's great to too. be back. Happy shooting, everybody. Thanks, Peggy. Thank and to the audience, of course, the, the, we will have you know the show notes on understandphotography.com, including links to Jennifer's website and the Photographers Against Breast Cancer website, and some examples of Jennifer's work, some of the winter winter scenes that she has. She's going to share them, and then of course you can link back and check out her her website to see all of her stuff. She has a lot of amazing workshops, so if you like. And you should like to go on photo workshops because that is the best way to get great photos, in my opinion. You know, if you go out there on your own, you're just not going to, it's not going to be the same as going out to, uh, let's say, to Yellowstone with Jennifer. You're going to, she's going to take you to the right places. She's going to go have the backup places. You're going to get up every morning. You're not going to want to do that if you're by yourself, but you'll do it when you're in a photo tour. So, so check out the photo tours that Jennifer offers. Again, understandphotography.com is where the show notes will be. And if you are struggling, especially with the technical side of, of photography, check out the four weeks to proficiency in photography. It just starts in a few days. Uh, it, it's a great price. It's, it's a guided class. I'm there to support you. You're going to learn to shoot in the manual mode. You're going to learn all about composition. You're going to learn lighting, including flash photography. You know, people are afraid of flash. It's not that tough. You can balance your flash to make nice, nice, 
evenly lit, nice pictures. And of course, the last class I call the, the techie stuff, and that's where you learn about your focus modes and your histogram and things like that. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for joining us on the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next week.